Okay, uh, maybe you can uh, start. Uh, so in the last lecture, uh, we discussed some models uh, which gave rise to this long-range entangled states and topology order. And uh, so, uh, so today I'm going to uh, discuss some kind of macroscopic or maybe mathematical uh, theory uh, for the topology order. So uh, the mathematical theory turns out to be so-called a category theory. So the question is why do you want to know about the category theory, and in particular the higher category theory? It kind of sounds scary, but remember this. Uh, uh, we our motivation maybe one of the motivation is to study a uh, gapless state which have an emerging symmetry, but the emerging symmetry is very general, and usually they are not in general they are not described by a group or higher group. So there's all kind of emerging symmetry, all kind of anomalies. Things became very uh, complicated. So it turns out that uh, this, uh, the topology order in one higher dimension happened to be the right theory, which it described with those uh, generalized symmetry. So therefore, uh, it's kind of amazing that uh, the study of a topology order <laughs> became a study of a symmetry. You know, this is a recent uh, realization. These two things maybe is uh, almost the same thing. Okay. So, so more concretely, the topology order in one higher dimension, like n plus one dimensional space, uh, is described by this uh, so-called braided fusion n category. So one plus one dimensional space is a braided fusion n category. So there's a shift. And then this, uh, uh, because topology order describes a symmetry in one lower dimension, then we say that uh, this uh, so-called braided fusion n category happened to describe a symmetry in n-dimensional space. So therefore, this braided fusion n category somehow replaces a group describing symmetry in n dimension. Uh, but this symmetry can be generalized, uh, etc. And uh, so then we say that a gapless liquid in n dimensional space are described by this uh, a symmetry, a emerging symmetry. Then you can also say that uh, yeah, these uh, gapless liquid states in n dimensional space are described by this uh, braided fusion n category. So this is a uh, this is why one study bridge fusion n category. It's a it's a it's a mathematical framework to describe a symmetry, and maybe it became mathematical framework to describe this gapless liquid states. And uh, so so actually I, I I don't know much about this uh, fusion category, higher fusion category, but uh, 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 so I can only give some kind of bare minimal. And uh, the 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 things that. Uh, I try to give a version which is describing those uh, categories they are using numbers. You know, uh, uh, usually the uh, standard way to describe category theory are uh, given by point and arrows and arrow of arrows, you know, those kind of things. But uh, there's a more quantitative way to, to describe it. So, so, uh, uh, so from this uh, 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 beginning, uh, we, we, had, we have this, uh, we have this uh, idea using grounded degeneracy uh, to describe this uh, uh, topological order. So, so in a sense, uh, uh, in this at this level, the topological order are described by a sequence of integer. You know, on different uh, manifold, there is a different degeneracy, and the sequence of integer would uh, like a numerical uh, way to describe a topological order. But certainly, uh, these uh, sequence integers don't have enough information. Uh, there's a, one need more data, more information, uh, just a, uh, uh, beyond this, uh, just a grounded degeneracy. So how to extract more information? So this, uh, this, uh, this more information is obtained uh, uh, by considering so-called moduli space. Okay, moduli space. The modulus space basically is just a, a space of a coupling constant, you know, from kind of symmetry, just space of coupling constant. Uh, but however, it's not a not arbitrary coupling constant. It's a, a coupling constant such that it gave rise to the gap Hamiltonian. You know, when you have you, when you have some coupling constant, it may your tone of coupling constant may go through transition, the thing become gapless. Then we should remove the gapless point. So those remove gaps are all removed. And uh, and after removing gap is point, then this a space of a coupling constant may have a non-trivial topology. You know, certain part cannot be connected to other part because uh, you have to, you have to go through the gapless point. 
And so, so, so this is a, uh, so that's the basis of the modular space. But this is, this is too general. So I don't know what to do. Uh, so the, uh, so here one, one, one makes some kind of logical or illogical step. And that is, a, we view this a coupling constant as a metric. So see in the manifold, they have a metric. And then we view this metric manifold, pretend they are coupling constant. So this is a reasonable, we have a, a particle moving in a free space. Uh, this mass can be uh, not scalar, can be a matrix. And the mass the matrix really play a role of this metric. So in some sense, you can view this metric as the, some kind of mass matrix of, of the particle with interaction and, uh, and such. So, so, so certainly this is a jump, but, uh, but doing this, so we'll, I, I can make connection to some mathematical theory. So therefore this modular space uh, in this sense became a space of a metric in a manifold. And certainly uh, choosing different coordinate gave you different metric, but those different metric was viewed as equivalent. So after equivalence of coordinate transformation, so this became more like uh, the mathematical definition of moduli space. You said metric is a space uh, of a metric up to this uh, equivalence relation by the coordinate transformation. Okay, but uh, but in kinetic matter, we 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 pretend this uh, the space of a coupling constant kind of can be modeled by this uh, metric. So this is a this is one assumption uh, we make. Okay. Then once you have this uh, this uh, space of a coupling constant, then you, then you have this uh, a grounded degeneracy. Then we have a fiber bundle. Basically, for every coupling constant, you have degenerate uh, subspace of a, a grounded subspace. And uh, when you're changing coupling constant, this subspace is a uh, rotate. Okay. And this really uh, this really uh, uh, became notion for a fiber bundle. I think I think nowadays maybe fiber bundle become more popular because of the topological insulator in the sense that when you study semiconductor, uh, we study this uh, dispersion relation a lot, and uh, so, uh, but 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 dispersion relation of an electron band only captures some information. Uh, uh, the more fuller information is captured by by consider the you know you know dispersion relation energy energy is eigenvalue. Then for every eigenvalue, we have also eigenvector. We are changing momentum wave vector in the brain zone, the eigen vector may twist around. So therefore, this uh, every energy band is not just dispersion relation. Actually, it's a vector bundle over the brain zone. The vector, the, the vector, the fiber, sorry, fiber is uh, is uh, this eigen states. And the basis space is a wave function or, or a wave vector which parameters the brain zone. So here is very similar. Uh, here, our our base space are labeled by parameter in the in the Hamiltonian, just coupling constant. But the fiber is this is a, a, is a degenerate grounded subspace. That's a fiber. So so that, so so we really have this uh, uh, this uh, fiber bundle. Okay. So 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 actually, this fiber bundle really uh, capture a lot of uh, information, and uh, so so this this became. Uh, one way uh, to describe this uh, topology order is really that uh, it's a it's a fiber bundle uh, over the uh, moduli space. Okay. Uh, it's, yes. It's, so, so yeah, the GIT is uh, something like metric. Or... Yeah, something like metric. Yeah. Actually, I hide a lot here. Actually, uh, uh, yeah, there, 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 there's something uh, kind of <laughs> this is a quite a jump from coupling yeah, constant but, to metric. Yeah, Metric matrix is symmetric, right? Yeah, this GI is equal to GGI. Yeah, yeah, it's the metric. So it's the metric. Yeah. So so actually, uh, to do this, uh, actually you can think about the quantum Hall states. The quantum Hall states have a mass matrix. The mass is the matrix. Then the uh, and then the, the the interaction potential depend on this uh, uh, the length uh, measured by this uh, mass matrix. You can you can present the mass matrix. Which have spatial dependence of mass matrix, and this mass matrix defines a metric. Then the interaction is given by uh, the distance measured by this uh, mass matrix. Uh, so this this way you can you can make a quantum Hall state into something like only depend on the metric in the space time. So that that will be that that will be the uh, uh, more precise uh, analog. But here I claim any other system 
somehow at the long wavelengths became uh, something live on the manifold. And uh, so the metric is the uh, important information. That, that, that's a big thing that, you know, on the last it has a lot of more information. But whether why at the long long distance we got a field theory which only depend on space time manifold, there's a big jump, and I think that's the, the liquid assumption uh, 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 play a role here. If your lattice model is a fraction, then then this step would fail. But if uh, if uh, if you if your ground state is not fraction, it's a liquid state. The liquid means that at the long wavelengths you only remember. The metric of a space time and somehow using metric of space time to simulate the carbon content, this is reasonable. So that is a, but there's a lot of junk here. Yeah. So, so like for preferred mass system, for example, the simple is to have a block, block electron. Yes. Can I think about the mass matrix of the block electron activity? Oh, uh, yeah. The On the lattice, uh, you can see. Uh, you, 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 the lattice may not be isotropic, and uh, so so they have mass matrix. When you deform the lattice, then the mass matrix deform. So that's like uh, your, the space time have a non-trivial, non-uniform metric. So they're like curved space. So the deform of the lattice is really similar to the curved space. So, so, so here we're using that language. But indeed, you can see near bottom band, the only thing you worry about is the curvature, and the curvature is a is a symmetric matrix, which is really play a role for metric of space. So it's in that sense, uh, 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 somehow only metric of space has survived at the long wavelength limit. Okay, and uh, so 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 now the now the question became uh, how to describe this uh, topology order. They say okay, we want to describe this uh, vector bundle. Okay, now how to describe vector bundle? Then the first thing is the barrier phase. So here we're describing the barrier phase, uh, which is called the U1 connection. Uh, that's a more formal name. And the barrier phase is a, is a, is really this, uh, because on, so, so here on the sphere, uh, every point of sphere, we have a tangent space, which is two dimensional space, that's a fiber. So tangent space on the point of sphere is a, is a fiber. We're moving along the, uh, along the sphere, we can try to do the parallel transportation. You know, we try to try to try to keep those uh, basis vector parallel as much as possible. But then, because sphere have a curvature, you can see that you know, do this parallel transportation around the loop. Then this uh, this uh, long vector and a short vector get rotated. So there's a there's some non-trivial rotation. So this is uh, uh, this really reflection of curvature. Uh, so this uh, so this also is a uh, one way to say the barrier phase. So this uh, this two D vector rotating is O two rotation, so the U one phase. So this is a, this rotation represents a barrier phase. So basically, is that a, so we have similar thing. You know, when we when we when we when you change when you go around this uh, uh coupling when you're changing the coupling constant slowly, this ground state subsystem should try to rotate. But we try to keep the basis. Uh, we we pick a basis, and try to try to make sure the basis more almost parallel. Almost parallel, but when you go on the loop, you find that the original basis vector may be rotated into another basis vector. So two basis vector in general differ by a unitary transformation. So this is called a holonomy. So you know the, that's a that's a one key factor of vector bundle. When you when you go around the this couple of time space, the the the, the parallel transportation may generate a unitary matrix. But the, here there's a one very important thing that is a if your ground state degeneracy is topological, this unitary matrix actually is diagonal. They only have U1 factor, don't have off diagonal factor. And there's an argument about this because uh, suppose that this, uh, this uh, when you go around the loop, a uh, contrastive loop, and uh, this unitary matrix uh, is have a non-diagonal uh, elements. Then you can imagine you're doing this uh, atomic physics experiments. Uh, you, you're changing the parameter, you have time dependent parameter just go around the loop over and over again. Some kind of floquet uh, situation. And then, uh, and then in atomic physics, there's a standard technique. When you have this uh, periodic uh, motion at the long, long, over a long time, you can view this uh, periodic motion as some effective Hamiltonian. Okay. Then, if this, uh, if this periodic motion, this small loop, generates 
the uh, 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 non-diagonal unitary matrix. The last means uh, uh, your effective Hamiltonian of this small loop can split degeneracy. That is key. And but here we already say that uh, the topology degeneracy is robust. You know, those DNA grounds say cannot be distinguished locally. So any local Hamiltonian cannot distinguish them. So that means that when you go around the loop, uh, the, 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 the ground state energy cannot be split. So that can only happen if this uh, phase factor is a pure Uran phase. So this is, uh, 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 so this relates to the degeneracy. So therefore it's pretty simple. It's a, so it's really a barrier space, just a Uran phase, so not, 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 not non-trivial, not abelian barrier phase. It's just a Uro, U1 barrier phase. So kind of like uh, this uh, topological insulator. And uh, uh, so, uh, so, so, and this barrier phase actually uh, have a have a con connecting to a topological term we are, we are familiar with, because uh, when you're changing parameters slowly go around the loop, you are actually computing a path integral and then computing this uh, uh, partition function. So this is a phase factor uh, we described. Uh, actually, it's a it's a phase factor in the partition function. So this effective partition function, effective theory, would contain this phase factor. And so, so what is basically really this? This partition function basically leading terms given by this uh, the energy density times space-time volume. That's the leading term in the partition function. Then we have a time-dependent uh, uh, parameter. There's a barrier space. The barrier phase appear as this uh, subleading term, some purely a phase factor. And uh, in this uh, fiber bundle uh, language, this barrier phase uh, have a uh, have a, a name because uh, here when we're changing coupling constant, we can imagine we are really changing the metric, so the the uh, GI, uh, background GIJ is changed. So therefore, uh, this time dependent uh, change of metric gave us a space time manifold curved space-time manifold. And in this curved space-time manifold, we can define some, so, something called a gravitational chain summon term, depending on the curvature, something like, a, actually like a chain summon term. <laughs> okay, so this uh, curvature we talk about, this uh, barrier space in the coupling constant, constant really means that we have a gravitational chain summon term. If you have that, you have a gravitational chain summon term. And the coefficient of a gravitational chain summon term is quantized. Just like an ordinary chain sum term, their coefficient is a, is, is a quantized, actually it's a rational number. And uh, so this number uh, with, with some units called the central charge C or chiral central charge C. Okay. So this, is a, so this is one way to characterize the gap state. The gap states have this uh, barrier phase in the parameter, in the parameter space. And this barrier phase in the parameter space mm -hmm. is given by this gravitational chain summon term. Okay. And so this will be one, one data to characterize this uh, topological order. And amazingly, this, uh, this uh, seemingly abstract uh, barrier phase have a uh, uh, have very important consequence at the, at the edge. So when this uh, topological order have a boundary, you may have a boundary gapless uh, mode. And uh, so they so so therefore this so-called central charge. The central charge is basically just a number of right-moving or left-moving edge mode. Yeah, we have a a a, a, a phonon moving to the right. You have a central that's this, this phonon extension. This mode gives us a central charge uh, uh, one. It's normalized this way. And uh, then because when you have a phonon, uh, you have a, uh, in one dimension the heat capacity will be proportional to uh, T and also one word velocity. The coefficient is a one for the phonon. But in general, for edge mode, the coefficient may be two or maybe one half, things like that. And then this is called a formally called a central charge. So the total heat capacity is a contribution from the right mover and the left mover. So you have this linear T uh, heat capacity. So this is a central charge is just really linear T heat capacity. It's just a fancy way to say that. But this coefficient somehow appear here. There's a little bit of shortcut is that uh, the coefficient appear in the gravitational sum term actually is not the sum of a, a right mover and the left mover. It's a difference. 
So this is chiral sign chart is a difference of right mover and a left mover. And so this is something quite amazing. That is a because of this 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 center charge the CR and the CL is a boundary property. But this but however their difference is not boundary property. Their difference is the bulk property. The difference of a right moving center charge and left moving center charge determine the bulk topology order. No matter what you do to the boundary, no matter you can make phase transition to the boundary, you never change this uh, uh, CR minus CL. So this is a, uh, so this is a, a something quite amazing. That is a, the, the boundary property is determined by the bulk topology orders. So that's in line that a certain symmetry determine Lorentz dynamics. Also here, the bulk topology determine boundary dynamics. And so there are certain feature which is totally depend on, depend by symmetry of bulk topology order. So this, uh, this uh, CR minus CL is uh, one such uh, feature. And this, uh, this one can be measured by the thermal hall connectivity, which you mentioned a little bit last, last time. Okay. So this is a, a so, so, so there's a barrier phase of the central charge uh, uh, factor. And actually what is uh, uh, more important is, uh, is another one, is uh, that uh, sometimes this, uh, the parameter, this uh, moduli space of a coupling constant have a non contractible loops. And the, around these non contractible loops, then uh, then this, uh, this unitary matrix can be non diagonal. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, uh, so this non diagonal unitary matrix would carry more information. Okay, what I try to say is that, uh, you know, at the beginning, we don't have a ground degeneracy, just a, a sequence of integers. Then by study barrier phase, we get one rational number, C. Okay. Now, by going through this non contractor loop in the coupling count state, we get a unitary matrix, like even more data. So, those are data uh, to describe this topology uh, uh, order. So, what is how to have a better understanding of the non, uh, this uh, unitary matrix? So, here I try to I, let's assume space is a torus. And I try to draw a, a loop, non contractor loop in the in the moduli space. You know, what is the non contract how to imagine there's a non contract loop in the moduli space? Okay. So here a uh, pass is a uh, I can I, I deform a torus from here to here. That's a, so this is like a pass in the moduli space. I deform a torus. Okay. And then when you come back to the my order torus, then it's we just glue this boundary to this boundary. Then we get this pass. These two boundaries are identified. But to get a non-trivial loop is such that uh, these two boundaries can be identified through a non-trivial map. Uh, you, there's many different way to map a torus into a torus itself. And uh, uh, so one way is to do this 90 degree rotation here. That's called the S matrix in two dimension. Or you can do this thin twist. You can, you can shear deform the torus until to get this shape. And this shape and the original shape can be identified via this coordinate transformation in this graph. So this is an example of this non-trivial map. So this, this non-trivial map from the, from the space to itself is called the mapping class group. So they form a group. Okay. So this is the point that uh, this, uh, this uh, non contractor loop in the moduli space is given by the mapping class group of a space. Okay, so so this uh, this pi one this non contractor loops is mapping class group. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, uh, for the argument uh, also works works here. But uh, if you do if you go through a non contractor loop, you will split it the same. And uh, so we use the contractor loop is more like a perturbation. Uh, you can do a big loop, you can do a small loop. A small loop is uh, like perturbation. So, so for the perturbation, you can never split the energy. Actually, when you do a non contact loop, you will split the energy. So this is actually important. I mean, so, you know, right now when people are using this, uh, this quantum energy as a protected qubits to do quantum computation, 
if your space don't have a boundary, you don't have a coarse particle, then you can do this kind of <laughs> non quantum loop to do this uh, uh, computation. So then the issue is that whether this uh, unitary matrix is uh, powerful enough, their product can generate a dense, uh, 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 a dense uh, unitary matrix. You know, for every non quantum loop, you have a particular unitary matrix. Well, the combination of them give you a dense set uh, across any unitary matrix, so that became universal computation. So it's a, it's a, it's a similar, yeah. And uh, so, uh, so this large loop really is a, is a, may correspond to large perturbation, so not small perturbation. So then you, you do split them. Okay. So, uh, so the point is that, uh, uh, the point is that, uh, you know, so this, this is not a billion barrier phase. Actually, uh, there's a, a formal way to say that. It's a, they form a representation of a mapping class group. Okay. So, uh, so the mapping class group representation, uh, more precisely, is a project representation of mapping class group. It's another data in addition to ground state in addition to this non-building uh, barrier phase, there's linear data to characterize uh, topological order. So, so basically, uh, we're mainly uh, thinking about this uh, mapping class group representation, which actually can be quite complicated. But however, if our space is a torus, it's easier. If a space is a torus, it's a, like this a pi one of a modern space is always uh, this XL NZ, N is a spatial dimension. It's, a, it's, a, it's a easy. And when n equal to one, that's one plus one dimension. In one plus dimension, this SL1Z is a trivial, this trivial group. And uh, so this actually relates to the thing that uh, in one plus dimension, there's no topology order. So it's consistent with uh, our desire that uh, this, uh, the topology order are described by this vector bundle. But in one plus one dimension, this vector bound always is trivial because the basis space is a trivial and uh, the modular space is trivial. Then the, the vector bundle has to be trivial. So therefore, indeed, uh, there is no one plus one dimensional uh, topology order in one plus one dimension. Um, for some people who know, uh, are familiar with the mathematics, there are indeed a non-trivial one plus one dimension topological quantum field theory. So, so it looks like there's something non-trivial even in one plus one dimension. Uh, but here I want to say that uh, uh, this, this uh, topological quantum field in one plus dimension, I think in, in kinetic physics correspond to symmetry breaking states. Uh, they have a ground state dependency on a circle. Even on a circle, there's ground state dependency. And uh, so, uh, so maybe this one plus one dimensional quantum field theory, top topological quantum field theory actually describes a symmetry breaking state. Uh, so this is a, uh, I think uh, what we think at the moment. And uh, uh, so in two plus dimension, uh, uh, the mapping class group actually is, uh, is SL2Z. The SL2Z are generated by this uh, two, two generator. One is a 90 degree rotation, it's like this. Uh, yeah, we have this torus, then we glue these two boundary by rotating, by exchanging X and Y. Then another is uh, this thin twist. We're gluing this uh, two boundary by shear deform one direction, but uh, not the other direction. And this so called is uh, this uh, uh, this uh, ST matrix. So therefore, for these two, for these two, for this kind of uh, geometrical uh, transformation, uh, we get the non-billion barrier phase. It's given by two unitary matrix, which is ST matrix. S for the 90 rotation, T for this uh, a shear or dang twist. Okay, and this ST matrix generate this SL2Z representation. So, so in two dimensional uh, uh, topology order, uh, in some sense, we can say that uh, uh, these topology order are quantitatively described by this ST matrix. There's S matrix and T matrix, and they form SL2Z representation. Yeah, this uh, may be uh, the, 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 the key thing I just mentioned, yeah. So there's a, uh, uh, that, that, that is a quantitative uh, description of this, uh, uh, Two deep, two, two plus and dimensional topological order. So here, yeah, so the polarization of transcendence term is uh, in the in the um, modular space. The, so so the metric is not the real metric. It's it's not. No, no, it's, it's real metric. 
So the uh, it's a, it's really this. Uh, so here, uh, yeah, maybe 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 can discuss this. So, so when you're deforming when you're deforming this, uh, uh, when you consider loop in modular space, you actually consider a time dependent metric. A metric in the space depend on time, and that's give you a a metric in space time. So so therefore, a, a trajectory a loop in modular space. Correspond to a time depend of uh, correspond to a curved space time, a particular curved space time. But however, this space time have have a uh, have a restricted geometry. It's a so sig a sigma g is a space is a genius g Riemann surface, and time direction always pi uh, s one. But however, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, something like that. That space time have this oh, with some curve, so with some curvature. But, uh, but uh, the G here is the real metric, or it's a It's a real metric. Oh, yeah. So, so the definition is different from before. before no, it's, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. Before, uh, what I try to try to say is the following: uh, there's a there's a barrier space in the coupling constant space, mm -hmm. but the barrier space in coupling constant space coupling constant space. Can be viewed as a passing integral in space time, okay. and this space time is have a special geometry. The space is a is a fixed time, just a circle s one. So this a time direction s one time s one in time direction correspond to the loop in the in the coupling constant space. So there's a uh, so there's a translation from coupling constant space to the real space uh, real space time. And yeah, this 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 connect this, this uh, yeah this this connection can be useful actually. Uh, uh, physically, can I think in, in some uh, different way? So I'm thinking about uh, couple the system to the background uh, metric. Can I think in that way? And uh, I improve out this. Uh... Yeah, you can think, but the metric. Yeah, you can see the system coupled to the metric. Yeah, the metric is a background metric, okay. so it have no fluctuation. So I uh, integral out all the dynamic fields. So I just get this. Then, then you'll get a partition function only depend on metric background metric, and then, uh, then, then it and this partition function may contain a phase factor, and this phase factor actually is correspond to the barrier space in the moduli space when you're mod when you're changing coupling constant. So there's a there's a this translation of changing coupling constant and the curved space time. This translation between the two. And then this translation is useful because then you can you can using some topological or algebraic topology in curve the manifold, then to make constraint on the on the barrier face in the coupling constant space. Yeah, so that is that is a, is a uh, connection. Okay, so the key point here is that uh, so when I say topology order is something very abstract. So now you can think about topology just ST matrix. That's it. <laughs> or maybe ST matrix is not enough. Maybe there's a central charge, Cairo central C. So ST matrix and a C maybe is a uh, is is a is a way to quantitatively characterize topology order. Okay. And uh, uh, so this became very concrete. So when you're using topology to describe a symmetry, you say, okay, this symmetry are described by this ST matrix and a C. <laughs> So this ST matrix just became name and label for the topological order, and also for the symmetry. If we think topological order can describe a symmetry. Okay. So so now let's uh, ask another question. You know, uh, whether this data can completely describe topological order or not. So there's a concern that there are two different topological order share the same ST matrix and the same standard charge. And uh, no, actually, this I think is not enough. So it's unfortunate. It's a, it's not enough. And uh, because we only consider torus, we have to go consider higher genius Riemann surface. You know, there's a similar thing of ST matrix uh, for higher genius Riemann surface. ST matrix is only for the genus of a G equal to one, the genus one Riemann surface. Okay. And they had to consider more general marking class group. That's enough. That maybe that maybe that's enough. We still don't know. That's still conjecture. But at least we know if you only consider torus, it's not enough. But on the other hand, if it's enough, uh, in practical, in practice, because uh, the the counter example found in this paper have a 
I forgot. Uh, fifty. Let me see. Have a lot of onions. Uh, it's a. Uh, let me see. Similar to fifty square. You know. Uh, you, you, so, 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 that, that's a simple example. I have. Uh, we know, but maybe they're simple. But maybe you not. Know, we don't. Uh, so, so we have a, a lot of onions. We have counter example, but we don't have a, don't have so many onions. Then estimation is easy enough. So, uh, uh, so, so at the moment, uh, that's how I, uh, I make this a practical something. We we pretend estimation is enough. Then using estimation to develop a theory for topological order. Uh, the reason for that is that, uh, you know, there's a uh, uh, there's a more complete theory. For topology order based on the more data. But the more data is just too complicated. It's very hard to deal with. And uh, uh, but the pretend estimation is, is enough, is uh, can actually can give uh, you know can can cover most of the, most most of the case. Okay. And uh, so actually relate to, to Zheng Chen's question and uh, so this is a connection between very phase in the moduli space or couple constant space. And also the space-time topology, you know, a curve of the space-time corresponds to a particular loop in the in the coupling constant space. Coupling constant space. So this uh, this this connection between the two uh, give us this uh, constraint that uh, the C is a central charge. Uh, is is a is very phase in the coupling constant space. And the DG actually is a ground dependency on the genus Riemann surface. Somehow, this a barrier phase in the coupling constant space, and the ground dependency have a constraint, you know, and uh, uh, so this uh, uh, this quantity has to be uh, in this product. This has to be integer. Okay, so uh, so so I, I find this a kind of an interesting thing. It's a, it's a very different physics somehow uh, connected, but this is really uh, based on this uh, picture. That's uh, the uh, yeah, this uh, this this barrier phase and the space time topology have a relation, and this relation actually is a, is a similar to the other relation in quantum Hall space, and uh, uh, maybe let's say so the, for the bosonian quantum Hall space, uh, we know we have a Hall conductance. The Hall conductance is like central charge C. It's a, it's some kind of barrier phase. That's a Hall conductance. And then the Hall conductance and the ground energy are related. Uh, uh, in, you know this. Uh, uh, so actually, in quantum Hall side, we have a, we have a similar uh, relation. Yeah. But what happened for P plus I T topological connected? Yeah, this is for boson. For fermion, there's a different constraint. Actually, this became really really interesting. And. Uh, uh, so actually, for fermion system, we have a similar relate similar relation, and that relation that that relation is, is saturated. For bosonic system, actually, uh, uh, this relation is not saturated. This this relation is a uh, uh, is a loose than what we know, you know. But anyway, uh, so, so so there's some uh, there's some relation. So I won't go into this. Okay, so. So let's pretend estimation is enough, you know. The next question is a is, is a falling. Uh, we know that the ST matrix form a representation of the uh, uh, of a, of SL two Z. Okay. So for every topology order, we have ST matrix. They form representation of SL two Z. So now we can turn the turn the question around. Can we use SL2Z representation to classify topology order? Uh, it turns out not. So not every SL2Z representation uh, corresponds to a topology order. Only some very special SL2Z representation correspond to topology order. Okay. So uh, so therefore our theory for ST matrix is uh, is not so good. You know. Uh, we have a data set, but the but the data do not give, give us a description. But uh, 
But our data set is too general. You know, most of the data actually is illegal. Only a small subset is illegal. And uh, so therefore, so we just say SL, ST matrix is SL2 the representation. It's not a very informative thing to say. If, you know, if you say that, then most representations don't correspond any tabular order. Only special representation correspond to tabular order. So therefore, we have to really to understand things better. We really have to dig, figure out which special representation uh, describe a tabular order. So this really became a classification problem. You know, how to classify tabular order? We can figure out the special condition on SL ST matrix on SL two the representation. Then we can really uh, obtain, uh, we can classify topology order, uh, making a table of topology order. So, so this, that, that makes this a, a mathematical theory of topology somehow more, more complete. Okay. So, uh, so therefore, we need to find some conditions on, on this uh, uh, SL, SL2Z representation so that the only special representation satisfy those conditions describing a uh, topology order. Okay, so, so how to find this condition? And the certain one condition is this one, S square and, and the ST cube, they kind of, kind of like equal up to this phase factor and equal to C, the C square to one. So basically like, remember S is like a 90, 90 degree rotation. Then S to the fourth power is a 360 degree rotation. So you go back, should be identity. Uh, amazing thing that uh, this, uh, the ST to the cube, uh, six power also is always identity. But this is, this is defining relation of SL to Z representation. You know, any matrix that this, this equation gave rise to the SL to Z representation. So we need some additional condition uh, beyond this to, to select special SL to Z uh, representation. Okay. So, so the question is how, how, how do we find more conditions? Okay. And actually the idea is the following. So let's consider torus, okay. In the torus, then you can make a, a, can be viewed as a sphere attached with a handle. Okay, that's one way to view a torus. Then you can make this handle very, very thin, very, very thin handle. Then almost it's so thin, maybe you, you feel I can ignore the handle. Then what you have is a sphere with two puncture, okay. So here I just want to, it's not something not logic. I just say the torus and the, and the manifold with the puncture have some relation. Yeah, you can pinch out a handle, then you actually get the, get the punctures, okay. The puncture is like a excitations, yeah. So therefore this, uh, this pinch torus and the, this torus, and the sphere with two excitations somehow are related. Indeed, this is true. The sphere with two excitations and the torus, these two data somehow is uh, very much uh, related. Okay. And uh, so, so, so this is the idea. So, so, so far when we consider this ST matrix, we only consider ground state. We did not consider excitation. And uh, this relation suggests that we should consider excitation. And then to seeking more uh, more condition on, on this. So actually, there's a uh, there's a, a little story here. You know, at the beginning, you know, uh, like in 1980s, when we try to think about this, uh, how to systematically describe uh, tabular order of quantum Hall states, uh, there's basically two two directions. One direction is using ground state property. That's what what I just described using ground state degeneracy the vector bundle, et cetera. Another direction is using this uh, excitation. Okay. And uh, so, so at that time, at that time, I feel I'm, I'm a little bit uh, resist to the excitation picture, you know, and uh, because I feel that uh, in order to use excitation to describe a, a phase of matter, I cannot consider only particular only one excitation. We have to consider all excitation. I find that the theory about all excitation is too complicated because the number of excitation is infinity. 
I have to consider infinite number of station. That's that's too that's too complicated. So so I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking about this uh uh this uh this uh, ST matrix using this using this uh this approach. But it turns out that uh, thinking about the extension is uh, at least uh, at the moment uh, we see that thinking about extension is more uh, 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 it's more helpful and actually the theory about extension develop faster and uh, so actually the this is this is a modular tensor category theory this is a scary name is actually just a theory to describe extensions you know and uh, so what when you hear Category, you say, oh, it's, it's just really theory for extensions. The higher category is just theory, not only for point extension, also for string extension. So two category theory is for point extension and string extension. Three category is for member extension, string extension, and the point extension. So 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 all those so so called higher category is just a, a theory for excitations. Okay. So, so similarly, uh, to really operate a more complete theory, we need to consider excitation. So historically, is that uh, you know we have, we have this a uh, uh, topological quantum field theory, which is kind of like a Ginzburg-Landau theory for topological order. You know, the Ginzburg-Landau theory is for the for the symmetry breaking phase, and for topological order, there's also similar Ginzburg-Landau theory. That's a like a topological quantum field theory. And in, in 1989, 1989, you know, we can find that this topological quantum field theory have a very close connection with the conformal field theory. And then in the same year, uh, there is a very systematic study of conformal field theory. And the tiny loss conformal field theory and the modular tensor category are closely related. So actually, the name of modular tensor category is given uh, in this study of conformal field theory. So that's in the early days. We see there's a topological quantum field theory or this topological order, and the multi cat category theory uh, has some relation. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so as I mentioned, that this is a multi tensor category theory, and uh, uh, it's basically the, it's a theory about the excitation. Okay. And actually, we can see that this uh, this uh, the theory about the ground state and the theory about the excitation have a very close connection. And the one way to see connection is through this picture. So here I'm describing this uh, uh, this uh, a torus, this x or y. Describing a torus, okay. The vertical direction is time direction. And we imagine uh, on the torus we have some degeneracy, okay. And then also we also imagine on above this uh, ground state we have some excited state, some excitation, the top of onions, okay. So then what is this path? This path that's describing, we create a pair of onion. We create a pair of onion from vacuum. And then we move one onion all the way around the X direction and annihilate them. Okay. So this is like a tunneling process by creating a pair of onion, then move onion all the way around towards the annihilate them. So therefore this, so, so this onion uh, tunneling process is an operator which acts on the degenerate ground state, we map ground state to another ground state, uh, to, to map the ground state subspace to ground state subspace. So this, this operator act within the ground state subspace. Then we can do another onion tunneling like uh, in, in Y direction, that uh, this term. Then we can do the onion tunneling, the first one, but in the opposite direction. We originally create a pair of onion, we move onion, in a positive x direction, but this time we move onion in the negative x direction, go backwards. And then similarly, we can do another one for the y direction onion in the opposite direction. So basically we have a four operator act on the ground states. Okay. Then the magic is that uh, we can deform this loop. We can imagine uh, because this there are two loops, but uh, but here we can we can we can uh, we can pinch the loop, <laughs> so uh, deform the loop. So then the uh, so this first and the third onion tunneling can be viewed as a, a loop in space time like this. And the second and the fourth onion tunneling can also can be viewed another loop in space time like that. So we, we do some kind of modification of the onion loop. 
Then, then what is this picture? This picture basically is the one onion going around another onion uh, by two pi. So this is the mutual statistics. If two onion have non-trivial mutual statistics, then there's a non-trivial phase factor. Okay. Then if you believe that, that means uh, the application of this four operator gave rise to the phase factor. So this is a Hessen algebra. Basically, it's a, it's a U W equal to a phase factor times W and U exchange U and W. So first onion, this so first onion is a U, the second onion is a, is a W. So therefore, that means that the ground state would form an algebra of this uh, representation, the U W equal to W U with an actual phase. And this phase is this mutual statistics. And we know that uh, this algebra have a non-trivial representation, uh, only uh, uh, do not have one, di one dimensional representation. And uh, so therefore, from here, we can say the ground state, the general ground state must be uh, from the representation of this algebra. So, so therefore, this ground state generally is a multiple of Q. Q is a, this, uh, uh, is a mutual stati fractional statistics, the denominator of this uh, fractional statistics. Okay, but anyway, so yeah, this uh, uh, is really the uh, simple example. We can see that the ground data picture and the expansion picture are very closely related. And uh, the so-called uh, module tensor category is kind of like that, actually. It's this kind of thing. But it's much fancier. They consider all kinds of uh, braiding, not, not just uh, like a two word line linked together. They kind of all kinds of uh, uh, possible linking or possible operation you can do. Uh, this a full theory is just uh, this module tensor category. Okay. I think uh, so. So so now uh, so now uh, we try to develop a theory for excitations. Yeah. So so what is the general theory of a uh, uh, topological excitation? Why this general theory of topological excitation is a is a category theory? Uh, what what kind of structure do we have? Okay, the the, the reason I'm ask, like asking this question is the following: is that uh, you know, for extension quasi particle we know about it. Is we have quasi particle, you know, we, we do we deal with that all the times, and we never encounter category theory. <laughs> you know, why we need a category to describe a quasi particle? You know, and uh, so here I try to do things uh, more carefully, uh, define quasi particle more carefully. Then hopefully by, 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 by doing things uh, more carefully, we can see that, yeah, we need something very uh, advanced like category theory to fully describe those uh, quasi particles. Okay. And uh, first I have to limit myself to gap the system because uh, the, the following definition do not work well for gapless system. So actually the quasi particle in gapless system is uh, much trickier to define, but for gapless system it's easier. So we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that. So for the gapless system means we have a Hamiltonian and we have a grounded subspace. Okay, and there's energy gap above that. Then what is the excitation? What is the excitation? You say, oh, excitation is any wave function not in the ground state subspace. <laughs> you can define that way. So anything here, uh, any sub near superposition of this will be excitation. But that's not what we mean. You know, that, 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 that is the excitation in atomic physics. But in the, in, the, in the many body physics, when we say excitation, there's some notion of locality. They're kind of local. It's locally somewhere. Okay. Then things become difficult. You know, then what do you mean by locally somewhere? So the so this is actually this is first is a pretty uh, fundamental. That is a we say the excitation is a excitation just a, another wave function basically. But this wave function is a ground state of a modified Hamiltonian. This modified Hamiltonian have a traps basically. We have a traps. Then the the ground state of this modified Hamiltonian describing excitation located near the traps. So those are the delta H describe a trap. The trap may just some kind of local Hamiltonian near a point and maybe near loop. So this L can be a loop. 
So we modify the Hamiltonian along a loop. So my trap can be a loop-like trap. Then that define a string equation. Yep. Okay. So this is a defined equation. And uh, so actually, but here we, 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 we add something extra. That is, uh, we assume this uh, Hamiltonian with a trap also gap, also have energy gap. So this energy gap, so this, uh, this, there's a granted subspace. So this ground subspace is a, a, is a, is a, is my excitation. So suddenly you find that that's already something quite a unusual, because excitation really means a particular wave function. But if you're using trap to define excitation, I do not specify a wave function. I specify, I specify a subspace. Okay. And this is actually important because it's kind of like a. Uh, it's kind of like uh, I'm using, uh, so for example, we're, we're using for, for electron system, let's see what happens. We're using a SU2 symmetric trap to define my excitation in the, like in the insulator. Then you find whatever I trap, either my trap don't trap anything, so we don't create anything. Or I trap something means some electron is trapped here. But because my trap have SU2 symmetry, then the trap state always have two for degeneracy. So in this way, we do not trap a spin up or spin down electron. We trap them together. Yeah. So this kind of notion is very important. So uh, uh, so the internal degree freedom is uh, hidden in this uh, degeneracy. This degeneracy is like an internal degree freedom for the trapped excitation. Okay. And this also relates to the thing. This, this internal degree freedom when can be shared to every trap can be fractional, don't have the integer. So we can have a weird thing like that. Okay. So this, uh, so this is very important. We have a trap to define quasi particle and the ground state subspace really to define the wave function. So excitation is a ground state subspace. Okay. And uh, so, so then, then how do I label quasi particle? It's very simple. This, this trap just a label quasi particle. For each trap, we have a quasi particle. Okay. Then we are facing a problem. We have an infinite number of quasi particle. And uh, so, usually, when we say we have an anion, we, 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 we don't mean a trap Hamiltonian. So, there's an equivalence class. So, if it is trap, trap of electron, then you change the trap a little bit. If it's still one electron there, we say they are same excitation, same type. So therefore, the uh, so next thing is that we have to define when the two trap Hamiltonian are equivalent. If two trap Hamiltonian equivalent, we say these two trap describing same extension. So that define the type of extension. So we need to define the equivalence. Okay. So first, uh, so equivalence is defined uh, uh, as this. Uh, if you can deform the trap Hamiltonian uh, continuously without closing this energy gap, then we say this is deform the trap will be equivalent to the previous trap. If, if, this, if two traps can be connected by deformation without closing energy gap, then we say these two traps are equivalent. And uh, if you can, you can deform the trap to zero without closing energy gap, that means this trap trap nothing. So that's trivial excitation. So the trivial trap means you can deform trap to zero and you, you do not close this energy gap. However, if you can deform the trap uh, to zero, you always uh, close energy gap. So that means they, that they, my trap traps something non trivial. So that's a kind of topological excitation. Then two topologies are equivalent if their trap if their, their trap can be deformed to each other without closing energy gap. So that's kind of a uh, usual uh, definition. Okay, so so this is a so this define the types. And uh, amazingly, that uh, for topology order, uh, 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 there are only finite number of types of excitation. Although we have infinite number of traps. But uh, the but most traps are equivalent. There's only a finite number of inequivalent traps and not define this uh, uh, topologization. So this is kind of formal way to define onion, you know. Uh, uh, 
if you want to define onion very carefully using the trap, using the equipment relation trap to define what do you mean by onion. And uh, this definition is very general, as including both abelian onion and non-abelian onion, which I mentioned uh, in the last lecture. OK. Then there's the shuttle day. Uh, this shuttle day is trying to be very important and uh, well, still kind of a uh, very uncomfortable. I, I, I think for me, I still feel very uncomfortable. The shuttle day appear in a higher dimension. When you have a point like extension, we don't have such shuttle day. But when you have a string like extension, a membrane like, like extension, there's a shuttle day. The shuttle day is a, it looks very, at the beginning, it looks like it's not shuttle day. That is a, the trap, when you have a string extension, my trap Hamiltonian should be a local Hamiltonian around this string. Should be local Hamiltonian. That's very natural. We will deform this local Hamiltonian. We also deform among the local Hamiltonian. Uh, that deformation class also local Hamiltonian. This seems very natural. But however, uh, but however, this definition have a problem. Uh, let's assume we have a trivial uh, product state. Then in three dimension, then we have a two dimensional trap. Then this trap travels some spin flip, okay, and the spin spin flip has some interaction, uh, has some complex topic. Then this spin flip uh, form of quantum Hall states. You know, th they are all possible things for the local Hamiltonian. Local Hamiltonian gives rise to quantum Hall states. And once you got the membrane, like a quantum, quantum house on the membrane, you can modify the trap Hamiltonian. Basically, you modify the Hamiltonian around the membrane. Because quantum house they have non-trivial topology order. There's no way to, to change that to trivial without closing energy gap. And there's no way to change one quantum house state to another quantum house state without closing energy gap. OK. So by this definition, we find that even for trivial product states, in three dimension space, we have infinite number of membrane station. <laughs> Each quantum house state is a membrane station. So the lot of extension is very, very complicated. <laughs> okay. So this kind of uh, extension we call the descendant extension, you know, because they are formed by trivial extension. In the product state, we don't have trivial particle. This trivial particle is not conserved, they can disappear by themselves. But the trivial particle can form a quantum Hall states as a membrane, as a membrane station, they are non-trivial. Okay. So, 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 so we, we feel very uncom uncomfortable with this kind of a descendant extension. We want to get rid of that. Actually, we don't know how to get rid of that, but there's a one proposal. Is that one proposal is that the, <laughs> the trap Hamiltonian can be non-local around the string. So that's different, different proposal, different class. Uh, we trap something, but this Hamiltonian along the string can be non-local. But however, away from the string, they are all local. So, so any two points on the string can interact. But however, a point on the string can only interact in neighborhood of a bulk. You know, that, that direction is local. Actually, I don't know what is, whether this works or not. <laughs> so uh, it's just pure conjecture moment. OK. And then if we, so therefore, uh, we can use this non-local Hamiltonian in one dimension or in two dimension to define our trap. Then our equivalence relation is much stronger. So any deformation among this non-local Hamiltonian is allowed to deformation, which if it will not close the gap, then yeah, then maybe that defines this. So this, using this non-local Hamiltonian, we define a different thing. We define elementary or uh, descendant. If something descendant means that uh, we can use non-local Hamiltonian to deform to trivial, to deform to nothing. And uh, uh, elementary uh, means that uh, there is no such a non-local Hamiltonian. Even for non-local deformation, we cannot deform that away. OK. So why, why go through this? It seems very complicated. But unfortunately, this is necessary. And, uh, one way to see if necessary is the following. Let's think about three-dimensional superconductor, which actually is a is a Z two topological order, <laughs> and uh, it, 
if you in, if you if you include the electromagnetic field as a dynamical gauge field, you know, three dimensional superconductor with a dynamical electromagnetic field is a Z2 topology order. And uh, so actually that's the first example of topology order. And uh, uh, amazingly, this uh, Kingston Lando theory for simple breaking state are developed <laughs> using the wrong example. <laughs> and uh, so so in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, three dimensional uh, uh, topology order, let's let's describing what what happens. What what is the distended station in this uh, three dimensional topology order? In the, uh, one of uh, you know in this uh, uh, in this uh, three dimensional superconductor or Z two topology order, we know there's a Borghese ball for quasi particle, which is a fermion, neutral fermion. This neutral fermion can can occupy a membrane. And form a P plus IP super topological breaking states. So that's a kind of membrane station. Okay. And this membrane station, and also we can think about it along a line. The, 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 this neutral fermion along a line can form this uh, a P wave with topological super in one dimension. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, Marana chain or TTF chain, you know, on this uh, one line. So that's a, that's a, that's a one dimension uh, string station. Uh, it's a P, P wave superconducting string station. And this kind of uh, string station forming by, formed by this uh, neutral fermions should be contract with uh, the vortex line in the, in the, uh, in the, in the superconductor. And I claim that uh, the vortex line is, is elementary, but this, uh, this uh, P wave line is a uh, descendant. So the claim is that uh, we have vortex line. You cannot get rid of the vortex line by even you using non-trivial non interaction, non-local interaction along the line. You cannot get rid of that. This, that seems more topological. But however, uh, when you have a, a P with superconductor conductor along a line, then when you, uh, this, this phase depends on the one dimensional uh, space. We don't allow non local interaction, you go to zero dimension. At the zero dimension, we don't have a P with topological connector, so we can get rid of that. Uh, so that's the one thing. Another thing is the following we have an elementary station like a string station. This string station cannot end, cannot have end. For some reason, the vortex line is more fundamental in some way. It cannot end. Even though the string station, this string station cannot have a boundary, the boundary is not allowed. But however, for any descending station, it's character that this descending station can have a boundary. It, it can end somewhere. But the certain boundary may be non-trivial, maybe gapless, maybe Marana zero mode, maybe something non-trivial, but it can have an end. The vortex line superconductor just cannot have an end. It's a very special line like extension. It's not, not cuttable, <laughs> you cannot cut it. And so, so therefore, so, this, so there, that is this, uh, this uh, distinction, so elementary and the descendant, and it's, it's kind of important. And actually, I wish to formulate a theory uh, for topological for excitation in topological order using only elementary excitation, because descendant there are too many of them. You know, any phase of matter is a descending station. It's too many, and it seems that's a kind of is descendant that means it's not that necessary. And we, we, can, we can get rid of it. Um, but unfortunately, you know, uh, I think in this paper, we kind of taking that point of view. We try to get rid of uh, the descendant, try to formulate the theory only using the elementary excitation. And, uh, but recently uh, there's uh, some, uh, some pretty fast progress uh, in this uh, higher category theory. But the one reason for the progress is that uh, uh, to include descendant as uh, in, in a structure. And uh, looks like if you include the descendant extension into the mathematical structure, the mathematical theory is, uh, is more regular, it's better. Since I don't know, I don't know the math theory, so I, 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 I couldn't appreciate that point. But uh, I was told by my mathematician, yeah, it's important to include this, but I still wish I, I don't need to include this. But anyway, so there's a, this is this, this two type of uh, excitation. 
But however, in, in two dimension, in two plantar dimension, uh, we, we don't need to worry about the string station, and we only need to worry about the point-like station. So most time uh, in this lecture, we, we, will, we will not discuss this the string or membrane station. But here, I just want to say that uh, uh, in higher dimension, we need to discuss the string and the memory station. And when we discuss string memory station, then this distinction of a descendant and elementary, and then there's a much richer structure. So a lot of uh, very rich structure. And, uh, uh, Can I think about this descendant state as certain type of like invertible state? Because no, don't have to be. For example, uh, uh, yeah, just like, uh, let me try to see this. Uh, because uh, it's a lot of change in the ground state and degeneracy, I think we can include it. But, uh, no, invertible state is a, is a, yeah, some descending system can be invertible, but some descending can be non invertible. It, it include both invertible and non invertible, include the both. And uh, so, so uh, the example I just gave, like a, in, in 3D superconductor, you have a line. And this uh, this uh, Bogolyubo fermion may form this uh, may form this P with sigma matter, and that is an invertible line. Uh, that is an invertible line. And uh, but however, uh, what's other example? Like in Z two gate theory, you have Z two charge. There Z two charge is the boson, and the Z two charge as a boson Z two charge have this uh, mode two conservation. So this Z two charge have a have a emergent Z two symmetry. Then there's a boson on the line may form a Z2 symmetry breaking states. And this Z2 symmetry breaking state is not invertible. So the both are descending extension. But the one is invertible, and now it's not invertible. Okay. Yeah, since you let me just since you've mentioned this invertible or non-invertible, uh, and I just raised one 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 very interesting issue here. Uh, because uh, in this uh, in the E2 superconductor, we have this uh, we have the line of a P P I P line, uh, a P with a line, uh, which is invertible. And we also have another uh, 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 a flux loop, a flux line, uh, just a Z2 vortex line uh, in the in superconductor. Then there's a uh, uh, there's a actually the issue uh, when when you actually have Z2 vortex line, you may ask. Whether my Z2 water line contain this uh, P with superconductor line or not contain P, P with superconductor line or not. And this became hard to determine, you know, because uh, this is invertible. So we don't see them as a degree freedom. There's no degree freedom. So, so, so actually, uh, and also this, uh, uh, this uh, Z2 water line cannot be cut. <laughs> you don't see the boundary Marana zero mode. <laughs> So, 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 so this became ambiguity. And this ambiguity sometimes uh, uh, can be uh, uh, important because in three dimensional uh, topology order, sometimes you have a line like uh, extension. And you also have this invertible uh, descent in the line. But you couldn't tell whether certain flux line have an invertible line or don't have an invertible line. There's an obstruction. For videos to tell to to have absolute certainty to say which one have which one don't have, and this abstraction represents another type of topology order. So this invertible non invertible is a pretty actually is very important. And also this uh, uh, later we will see that uh, this uh, uh, those uh, invertible uh, line let me describe a symmetry. Invertible line correspond to this uh, 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 higher group symmetry. They are invertible. But the non-invertible line gave rise to non-invertible symmetry. So that in that sense also uh, very useful. Yeah. So so the, the, that, so that's a uh, that's a, yeah, let's catch it. Do you expect descendants and non-descendants to be distinguished by whether the excitation can in some sense be detected as activity? Yes. That's a way. The, the, the elementary one can be detected at infinity. But descendant one cannot. So that's another way to, to do that. So if you if you're using this remote uh, remote detection, this uh, you know remote detection only apply for elementary one, and uh, for the descendant one, it, they cannot be, uh, detect remotely. So in some sense, you can see this is also reasoning 
why include this end in the one? This will make your life much harder. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still hoping, and uh, I still feel that uh, maybe there's a better uh, hierarchical theory not including descendant, only in terms of elementary. I'm still hoping that exists. But uh, at the moment, the mathematician is just going in another direction. In the, in the case of the Cloudy Paradigm, can you consider domain wall as a, a yes. elementary? Domain wall is elementary, please. <laughs> Why do you say you can ignore string excitation and we talk about domains? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a very, very good question. And uh, yeah, maybe I will, I will, I will, I will, I will go there. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I will discuss that. Yeah. Cool. Indeed, uh, uh, so in, in, in D dimension, we can consider D minus one dimension as an excitation. But why you only consider D minus two and the lower? Uh, there's a reason to do that, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think I think I, I already mentioned this. Yeah, the type of excitation, just a, if we can deform a Hamiltonian, the trap Hamiltonian without closing energy gap, then the two two extensions will belong to the same type. Okay, that's very easy. But somehow there's a there's a we miss uh, something. There's a simple type and a composite type, which is actually a very very important concept. But somehow uh, in physical theory of uh, quasi particles, we we kind of uh, uh, overlook this uh, distinction. So let me try to. So this is actually a very important uh, concept. Simple and a composite. So what is concept? You know, here I say that uh, uh, we have a we have an extension, we have a trap, and we have a one say subspace. Okay. And uh, so let's see. So so this this the other thing means uh, given by those trap. Okay. Then we can ask the following question. Let's uh, only modify one trap small slightly. We modify this trap slightly. The ground, ground subspace may rotate into another ground subspace. So this is what we talk about. Is a, yeah, we may have unitary transformation connecting two ground subspace. But there's one more possibility. They may split. Because uh, we may have an accidental degeneracy. That is, uh, suppose we have a trap. We trap a, a, a uh, we trap a spin zero extension and a spin one extension at exactly the same energy. So my trap have a full degeneracy, full full degeneracy. But full full degeneracy really coming from spin singlet and spin triplet. Then we modify your trap a little bit, still maintain rotation symmetry. Then you may split singlet, triplet may split. So this uh, this may happen. So in the mathematician, when the mathematician talk about the excitation, certainly never talk about excitation. They, they call it object. Okay, when they say the object. Actually, their object including this accidental degenerate excitation. So I think in physics, when we say excitation, we already assume there's no accidental degeneracy. But in general, if you do things very carefully, just, just do a trap, uh, do a ground state subspace, this definition includes this accidental degeneracy. And uh, so, so therefore, this composite type, it just means that we have accidental degeneracy. And amazingly, that uh, the first order phase transition is also can be that accidental degeneracy. You know, right at the first order phase transition, the two ground states are accidental, de accidental degenerate. And this feature works uh, for, for the, for the string-like uh, membrane-like station. Suppose we have string-like station, and uh, uh, one, the, uh, one string is a one phase, another string is another phase. Then we may, we may tune the Hamiltonian on the string right at the First out of phase transition between two phases. Then at, at that point, uh, my string station is composite. It's a is either phase A, phase B have the same energy. So that's that kind of composite. Okay. So the composite really we are this way. So this uh, this if alpha is a composite, it's like a direct sum of a two excitation i and j. You know. Yeah, this 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 thing confuses me a lot because we will have a we will have a spin zero and the spin one excitation. Then when we say, oh, 
we always think about ten tensor is a spin zero bound state with spin one. But here is not tensor. It's a it's not bound state with spin zero and spin one. It's a it's a sum. You have sum. And uh, so it's really the sum. And uh, for my own, I have this uh, confusion before. That is a uh, because usually people don't write this as a circle with a plus. People just write a plus. When you write a plus, I'm thinking of what the plus means. Maybe superposition of i and j. So for a long time, I think about this uh, is a quantum mechanical superposition. I, I just don't understand what this relation means. So you can imagine I have a hard time to read the GTF the appendix. <laughs> we will think that way. But, uh, but actually, it's a uh, it's really a direct sum, and uh, it's really this uh, uh, this composite that just accents the denial thing. But but this this uh, uh, this uh, this generalization is uh, uh, important in in, in, uh, in building this uh, the the mathematical theory uh, for the expectations. Okay, so so that is uh, uh, so that, that, that's a basic main thing, and uh, so maybe the last I will I will, I, will, I will end with this uh, this uh, fusion fusion ring. So now we get a, so with, with those uh, preparation, finally we can reveal some more sophisticated structure of uh, excitation. The fusion ring just describe the bound states. The bound states sound to very, very simple in physics. You have electron and the proton bound state get hydrogen atom, and that's it. And uh, there's no big deal. But when you think about the excitation more carefully, the bound state became very tricky. So what do you mean by bound states? So bound states really means that uh, we have two traps, one at I, another at uh, I1, I2, we have two traps. So you mean I1, I2, just two traps. OK. We have two traps, we'll stay very far away. You can view two traps as a one trap. Then the two extensions become one extension. So that is really fusion. That's really, that's really the fusion. You know, uh, when, when I say, when i is one trap, j is another trap, but i tensor j can be viewed as a, we view two traps as one trap from very, very far away, and that's it. So nothing changed, which is the point of view is changed. Okay, but there's an issue. When two traps is viewed as a one trap, this single trap is a very special trap. It have two centers. The, Usually a single trap have one center, but this single trap have two centers. So it's a special trap. So therefore, this special trap may have accidental degeneracy as a one trap. When you view this one trap, they may have accidental degeneracy. So that's why this composite excision became very important. So in a sense, uh, so when the two traps are separate far away, yeah, you have a degenerate subspace. When the two traps are getting closer and they start getting mixing, they may split. They may split. So this is splitting. Then, then that means that uh, uh, after splitting, this became a, a so-called a, a simple excitation or a simple, not composite. So two trap is composite, and they may split. It becomes simple. So this really the notion that the bound state of a two excitation are in general a composite. It's not like a, a electron proton give a hydrogen and the both they they are all simple. Electron simple. Proton simple, hydrogen simple, but in general, the the uh, the 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 bound state of two excitation is composite. It's really, the example is like a spin one half and a spin one half. Their bound state is a composite of a spin zero and a spin one. So it's a it's a this. Then we have this fusion rule. The spin one half, spin one half can go into spin zero, and the spin one half, spin one half can go into spin one. So this gave, gave him a fusion, ma fusion matrix or fusion ring. They define the product. You know, have a, we call this ring really that uh, this kind of object can have a have the product operation also have some, some operation. Some of this is a direct sum composite operation. The product is a fusion. And then we have this, uh, this operation to describing this, uh, their bound states. So it's an NIJK describing the, the bound state structure. And uh, so, uh, so, 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 therefore, we suddenly have this uh, uh, this uh, NIJK describe a, a fusion of uh, two elementary particle, two particles. And so now we see that uh, the, the theory for the for the excitation is pretty non-trivial. You have uh, this uh, 
all these uh, structures. And, uh, and also NIJK certain should be an uh, integer tensor uh, with a uh, no negative entry or non-negative integer tensor. And uh, also they should have associativity. Means that uh, when, when we fuse uh, IJ first and the K later, or fuse JK first, I later, we should get the same thing. We get the same, like we have three trap. Either we make this trap closer or make a second or third closer. At the end of the three trap, you just got the same thing, the same single extension. So therefore, as a as a zero three tensor, this associativity, you can go through some exercise. It means that this rank three tensor is special, satisfy this relation. Okay. And I think I think that's a uh, yeah yeah this, maybe maybe this is a, this is the main thing is that the the, the theory for quasi particle is a little more complicated have this kind of fusion ring fusion structure and uh, and uh, and this is a fusion ring not fusion category you know so 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 they only reveal some structure we need so there's more structure so. Uh, when adding the more structure, you get a fusion category. And uh, uh, so maybe uh, uh, next week we will we will slightly talk about this uh, uh, other structure. Uh, mostly I will avoid this uh, other structure, which is called F symbol. And uh, 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 but it, it will just talk a little bit. And then from 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 all this, uh, we combine with ST matrix, then we can start to have a more or less complete theory. Uh, for the uh, for the topology order, uh, which enable us to create a table for topology order, and uh, and this kind of uh, picture is useful maybe later when we want to use topology order to describe symmetry, so those kind of things are kind of useful. So those I introduced here. Okay, and other questions? I will, I will end here. I yeah. have a naive question related to how you define topological excitations. You defined it in terms of having a ground state that, yes. that uh, can turn into uh, subspace after the excitations. Why don't we, why couldn't we do that for trivial, topologically trivial systems uh, in the same kind of, why, I mean, why does only exist in topological systems this kind of description? Uh, actually, this, this is an excellent question. Actually, we can do that for the trivial system as well. Okay. Uh, but here, uh, uh, for the trivial system, uh, what we have is uh, uh, we have a symmetry. When you have a symmetry, then you, don't, you want to maintain the symmetry to see the symmetry property. Then you design your trap to be a symmetric trap. And then, then you can have uh, this, uh, then the extension defined by symmetric trap with the carry property of a symmetry. And they, all, they can also fuse. You know, the NIJK can be defined. They can also fuse. They can also have other things, a braid and fuse. So therefore, if you, if, if you do this trap and extension, you define symmetric extension, and they have this fusion and all that. And there's a fusion category, very scary name, uh, to describe those uh, trap extension. And uh, actually, I would say this is a experimental way to describe a symmetry. So imagine, suppose uh, uh, you have a sample with a symmetry, but the symmetry is absolute in our universe. We cannot even break symmetry by our instrument. So therefore we can only design symmetrical trap. And this have a problem because uh, we only have a symmetric instrument. We cannot do symmetry transformation symmetry transformation breaks symmetry. So our ordinary way to look at symmetry is actually by breaking it, by looking to the symmetry. We already break it, you can look inside the representation. But if your symmetry cannot be broken, even if symmetry, even the instrument cannot break symmetry, then we cannot look into the symmetry. Uh, we cannot look into transformation. Then there's an expanded question. How do you measure the symmetry? How do you know your system have a symmetry if you both your sample and your instrument have a symmetry? And which symmetry? 
So the so what I'm describing here actually is a way to to using symmetric instrument to extract which symmetry you have by not marrying symmetry group, but marrying the fusion of symmetry charge, these representations. And actually, there's a, a famous uh, a theorem, it's a Tanaka duality. Uh, by measure those uh, fusion and uh, of this symmetry charge, uh, you can recover the group. So this uh, fusion language and the group language is uh, have same information, there's no loss information. And uh, the, I was trying to say the group language is a theoretical, theory is the way to describe symmetry, and the fusion is supposed to be experimental is the way to describe symmetry. And uh, so in, actually, uh, if you if you look at the, although this kind of thing is, seems very theoretical, very very fancy, something like that, but uh, but it really follow very well about the measurement. We only talk about something which can be measurable, and uh, just just in terms of those uh, measure the thing. Uh, like for example, we don't talk about the wave function. The wave function with the phase factor is unphysical. The wave function itself is unphysical. And here we talk about degeneracy. What is a ground, degeneracy ground subspace? In principle, you can use in heat capacity to measure degeneracy. Uh, something very difficult. So, so in a sense, uh, so this is a way actually even go beyond the wave function. You know, we, we don't even have this uh, phase factor wave function to come into play here. And so it's a very physical way uh, to describe a quantum system. And uh, and here I'm really using topological order as an example, but uh, a symmetry should be better example. Yeah, yeah. Use, use, using this way, just as I say, if my instrument do not break symmetry, how do I measure symmetry group? Yeah, that, that is the question. And then what I described, the fusion ring is a way uh, you can measure fusion ring, you can measure part information of symmetry group. Yeah. In the fusion ring expression, you mentioned that the n numbers can be any non-negative integer. Yes. If I think of that as an accidental dependency between k1, k2, what does n equal to two mean? How does it mean? Yeah, I think the two really means the uh, following. Uh, yeah, the experiment uh, kind of skip is as a so usually the IJ fuse is became some K1, K2, K3, K4. But sometimes the K1, K2 is the same type. It's like a, you, you, you can you direct sum of two spin one half. <laughs> so here I just combine this, like, if K1, K2 is the same type, both, both, both K, then I just say, I say it's two K, I just put the two there. So the so the two of n is not a multiply two. It's a direct sum. It's a I don't know. This yeah. This is a these two really means that in the sense of a direct sum. Yeah, but direct sum. What do you mean by direct sum of vector space? It's a tensor product of two vector space. So direct sum also become tensor product. So the whole thing becomes super confusing. Yeah, you know this uh. uh but this is just a, a all, all layer of things, yeah. So the, the two really means the, the two copy of a direct sum of two of the same representation. Yeah, you can actually, yeah, you can view this IJ as a representation, you know, as label representation. You know, sometimes when you fusion tensor product of two representation, the third representation may appear by two, two copies, then you put the two there. Yeah, so this fusion ring just have that meaning. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'm kind of too quick here, yeah. Okay, yeah, see you next week then. <laughs>